Let's commence this evening with Hafiz Abdullah Sheikh Tilawat, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Translation To Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. Whether you show what is within yourselves or conceal it, Allah will bring you to account for it. Then He will forgive whom He wills and punish whom He wills, and Allah is over all things competent. <coughs> the Messenger has believed in what was revealed to him from his Lord, and so have the believers. All of them have believed in Allah and his angels and his books and his messenger, saying, we, mo we make no distinctions between any of his messengers, and they say, we hear and we obey. We seek your forgiveness, our Lord, and to you is the final destination. Allah does not charge a soul except with, what, with that within its capacity. It will have the consequence of what good it has gained, and it will bear the consequence of what evil it has earned. Our Lord, do not impose blame upon us if we have forget, forgotten or erred. Our Lord, and lay not upon us a burden like that which you laid upon those before us. Our Lord, and burden us not with that which, with, which we have no ability to bear, and pardon us, and forgive us, and have mercy on us. You are our protector, so give us victory over the disbelieving people. Jazakum Allah Sadaqum Allah 
Jazakallah khair, uh, Abdullah. I uh, would like to introduce our uh, Master of Ceremonies for the evening, uh, Khalid Malik. He is a mentor for men, uh, a radio jockey, and uh, also the MC for this evening. Um, Khalid, please join us on the stage. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallim tasliman kathira. Um, thank you, Ali. As uh, Ali pointed out, I am an actor and I'm a radio presenter. Ha ha, I'm a And uh, subhanAllah, I, I couldn't think of a more productive, transformative way of ushering in um, a new year. And what a year it's been. You know, if anyone's, anyone's traveled to Turkey, put your hand up if you travel. I, I'm probably 100% of you <laughs> go up on Instagram, everyone's in Turkey. Um, but if you've ever been part of some of their communities, they have a beautiful word, and that word is um, sohbet. And what it essentially means, it, it means that it's, it's, it's a conversation, a, a discussion between seekers of Allah. And I found some of these communities to be very transformative. And, and I pray for myself and for you that each one of us, and especially me, from tonight and tomorrow, if you haven't got the ticket from tomorrow for tomorrow, please go ahead and do so, that that I leave and that you leave with one piece of insight because all it takes is that one piece of insight to transform facilitated by this community that is the live Dean. Um, I'm going to just step off stage and, and, and let me just uh, soak this in for a moment because it's not the kind of event that I'm used to hosting and so I, feel, I believe there is a, a transition that is happening behind the scenes as it were. So I'm just going to hop down so just give me a moment. <clears throat> Here you go. And uh, I'm so, so um, I'm delighted to be actually doing the event where, in which Dr. Qadi is at. I mean, that's amazing, subhanAllah. Um, so it's been, it's been a freak out year. So I do breakfast radio, uh, for those that may not know, but I've, I've come to know that a few of you heard the show. Th fantastic. Um, and we put out a survey and we asked people what they thought of 2022. Some of the feedback that we got were the following. I feel doomed. I feel ditched. I've been freaking out. And it's been a freak out kind of year. That's the narrative that's sort of run through consistently throughout the year. Would you agree? If those that agree, put your hands up so I know. It's been a freak out kind of year. We don't know what's going on. And that's just been the general kind of narrative. Um, and so let's, let's do a quick survey. If you could all stand up, please. I know you're thinking he's an actor. What is he going to get us to do? Stand up, all of you. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> all right. Cue music. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. So here's the question. Which one of you has ever fallen in love and if you've ever fallen in love keep standing for those that haven't fallen in love sit down <laughs> remember honesty is a virtue by the way <laughs> thank you for being so honest thank you you can sit down thank you so much so remember that love when you fell in love how it felt to fall in love you felt like you were unstoppable. You felt like time was irrelevant. You felt like you could look up to any challenge. Remove the subject of love for a moment. Just remove the subject of love and remember the emotion of love. On the emotional scale, you know, you get anywhere from anger up to love and love being this high vibrational emotion that, uh, that facilitates this, this feeling of I can achieve whatever I put my mind to. And then what happens? Fear and doubt creep in. Fear and doubt. They begin to fester. They begin to infect you. And as they do, you now feel, as the Quran describes, like you're in the, at the bottom of the ocean, in the depths of the ocean. And the Quran describes that it's like darkness upon darkness. And it continues to fester, it continues to infect. 
that fear and doubt. You get sucked in to the competitive nature of the world to a point where now some contemplate taking their own lives. And we all know that the rate of suicide goes unreported here in Pakistan, but it is on the rise quite frightfully and especially amongst the youth. And so you get sucked in to the, the competitive and um, anyone that's heard of Dr. Naqib al was a, was a, a Malaysian philosopher, the, the terrestrial nature of this world, which means that you're being pulled away from your celestial reality, from your soul reality. The competitive nature of the world, is, as the Quran reminds us, it diverts you from Allah. And so I pray that leaving tonight and tomorrow, that in some way, through this sohbet, that you're able to feel the love that Allah has for you. I'm delighted to be introducing Sheikh Saab. I've heard you many times, um, thanks to YouTube. And I've seen, and I'm going to invite him on stage. Before I do, it's so good to see scholars and learned men and women who have a pulse on the current situation, especially amongst the youth, and to know what it is that they're going through and the question that they have, and have this open door policy. I remember when I was um, 16, 17, um, I was living in Melbourne, Australia, and I was you know, getting interested in the Dean and I was studying the Dean and I was also trying to get good grades. Like any Pakistani family, you needed to become a doctor. I ended up becoming an actor. It really made my parents proud. But I want to just touch on that too. But there's something to be said. So I, I, I remember reading about mind sciences because I had to get good grades and I was reading about psychology and I'm reading about something called meditation. And so side by side, I was you know, curious about the Dean. And so in Melbourne, there was this big mosque and I called the mosque and I, in those days you had access to the Imam. And I called the Imam, Assalamu alaikum Imam, um, is there any meditation in Islam? What do you think his answer was? Anyone? What was his answer? Yes? I wish. A 16, 70 year old interested in the deen now being introduced something called meditation. Wondering, can I, can I reconcile? Can I bring this to my practices as a Muslim? His response was, stuck for a lot. There's no meditation in Islam and he hung up on me. And I said, well, there you go. <laughs> Off to another door. I'll open another door somewhere. So, so, it's so it's so humbling to know that we have scholars and learned men and women who are open to the questions that so much of us are seeking. We, we all have our own external circumstances. We all have our pain and suffering. And each one of us is going through. And so if you, tonight, you are here for a reason. Either you are forced to be here or it's turned up. You are here for a reason. So I, I'm hoping you have pads. So let's help us. Your mic is going off and on. If you could let compass an intention, because what we're doing is your, 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 your journey this evening, and it's important to set compass. Can you hear me? Yeah. So in your notepad, write your intention. What is your intention for tonight? What do you want to achieve? What are you hoping to get answered? What are you hoping to get answered tonight? What is your intention for tonight? I want everyone to write this down. This is very important. Because what this does, it gives you a direction. It, it sets your compass. And this is personal to everyone that is here. Your, your intention for tonight and maybe these next couple of days. What is your intention as you set the compass? I'm going to move aside and I'm going to introduce um, our esteemed speaker and, and guest. Welcome to Pakistan. Um, I've, as I said earlier on, I've, I've seen him um, from a distance. Um, and uh, in fact, my, my wife has actually attended one of your courses when you were at Maghrib a long, long time ago, Maghrib Institute. Um, and I've seen him also from a distance evolve. Um, and that piques my curiosity. Yes, a classically trained scholar, but 
more than that i love it that he 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 knows the he he's aware of the impact that the world that we live in has today on all of us all of us and we're looking for some of these answers so please uh, make him feel very welcome we're talking about letting go are you ready so let go <laughs> please make him feel very welcome pleasure to be introducing you dr sheikh yasir qadi welcome assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Alhamdulillahi wahdah wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'dah. Amma ba'd. Hamari liye to bhoti ezaz ki baat hai. Kya ma aap se Karachi mein, Pakistan mein, aise shandar hall mein aap se guftugu kar raha hoon. Or is se ziyada bhi ek ezaz ki baat hai ke jis mauzu pe hum guftugu karenge, wo seerat Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hai. Or the third thing is that don't worry, I'm not going to speak in Urdu. But I will use the words that I will use to use the words that I will use to use Urdu. You all know that our family is Pakistan and Karachi. But our birth and life is in America. So I will say that my mother's language is English and my mother's language is Urdu. But my mother's language is English. I have never learned Urdu in formal Urdu. Unfortunately, I don't have to write Urdu until now. So I am talking about Urdu in Urdu. ये घर की उर्दू है, लेकिन मुझको ये भी एहसास है कि there is a need कभी कभार उर्दू में भी गुफ्तु करने के लिए, तो मैं अपने आप को जरा शर्मिंदा करूँगा and be open to criticism and ridicule कि जरा से उर्दू में यूँ शराब से आपसे जुमला इस्तेमाल करूँगा और आपसे ये दरख्वास्त है, in all honesty इसलिए कि ऐसा ही इंसान सीखता है, ऐसा ही इं احساس کیا کہ میں نے لفظ جو ہے غلط استعمال کیا تو آپ لکھ لیجئے نوٹ پہ اور آگے بھیج دیے گا کہ نیکس ٹیم یوز دس ورڈ انشاءاللہ میں اسے امپروف کروں گا بہرحال the finer concepts must be done in English because that is indeed my mother tongue آج کو جو ٹاپک ہے ایک ٹاپک ہے جو ہر انسان کو ہر مسلمان کو بل کہ یہ بھی کہہ سکتے ہیں مسلم کافر کس میں کوئی اس سے تعلق نہیں ہے every human being اسی ٹاپک کے ساتھ شغل کرتے رہتا ہے لیکن مسلمانوں کے لیے اس ٹاپک کا جو ہے it becomes even more relevant and important اور وہ ٹاپک یہ ہے کہ ہماری زندگی میں بہت ہی زیادہ پریشانیاں ہوتی ہیں بلکہ آپ دیکھئے there is not a single human being except that he is surrounded by anxiety and grief and stress جو بھی سوچتا ہے کہ کسی اور کی زندگی میں کوئی پریشانیاں نہیں ہیں Whoever believes the Instagram stories or Facebook posts of your friends or acquaintances, then honestly you are deluding yourselves. Every human being is struggling. And I want you to understand this point. You know that person you see on Instagram in a faraway vacation? You know that sister or that brother who posts something and it seems picture perfect? The fact of the matter is it is just a picture. There is not a single person on this planet except that that person is overcome with doubt, anxiety, stress, internal parishaniya and external musibat and problems. And it doesn't matter who the person is. And this is a hairangi ki baat hai. Vaakhi magar aap soche hai, something's wrong. Yeh koor parishaniya dekh rahe hai aap. Meri daari? Daari to nahi hati ki, lakin thik hai, niche gar lenge, okay. Another strange aspect, kabhi kabaz, the same thing is both the source and the cause of the parishani, its absence and its presence. So for some people, for example, for some people, not having money is the major source of stress. For others, it is their money and investments and what's happening with it, or these days, the fact that it's plummeting downwards, is the cause of stress. For some people, not having children is the cause of stress. For others, their main stress is their children. For some people, being single is stress. Well, for others, <clears throat> dot, dot, dot. I mean, I wouldn't know, but you know, I have heard that some, because I have relatives of my wife sitting here as well, so I have to be very careful. I have relatives in the audience, so everything will be transferred back home. So I have heard that some people have problems in their marriage. I wouldn't know, 
But I have heard there's something called husband-wife fighting, right? My point is that there is no such thing that gives ultimate peace in this world. If you have something, it's going to cause you some stress and problems. And if you don't have something, it's going to cause you stress and problems. So the question therefore that arises, why is this happening? Why is there no stress-free life for anybody? Why is life always one obstacle after another? That is the reality. And then the second question that arises, karenge kya with all of these parishaniya? Iska hal kya hai? Kya kabhi aise ek mauka a sakta hai, aise ek marhal a sakta hai in zindagi mein, jahan pe koi parishaniya nahi hai? Kya Allah Ta'ala ne isi liye humare liye deen nazil kiya? Kya maqsad e deen kya hai? Parishaniya dur karne ka hai? Ya kuch aur maqsad deen hai? When we look to the Quran and Sunnah, will we have all of our problems solved? And then the other question arises, ان پریشانیوں کا وجود کیا اس کا مطلب ہے کہ اللہ تعالیٰ مجھ سے ناراض ہے کیا اس کا مطلب ہے کہ میں نے کچھ گنا کیا I'm being punished I mean why are there so many I'm not going to sleep at night I'm overcome with issues, problems کیا اس کا مطلب ہے کہ اللہ مجھ سے ناراض ہے استغفر اللہ میں نے کچھ کیا I know I'm not a perfect person I know میں نے بہت زیادہ گنا کیا ہے And the more I look back and the more I examine, the more I realize kitna mein na farma, na farma or whatever, na shukra, whatever you call it, right? I know I'm a bad person. I know I've done so much wrong. So are these parishaniya because of my own wrong? Is this a type of punishment? In which case, does this mean I should just give up? I mean, Allah, Allah's not happy with me because I'm in so much stress. If Allah were happy with me, I wouldn't have this stress in my life. So the fact that I have so much stress, so much problems, kya iska matlab hai ki that's it, all hope is lost. Chan logo mein aise maayusi paida ho jati hai, ki bas wo sochte hai, there's no point in being religious. Akhir jab faisla hoi gaya, lagta hai ki astaghfirullah mein kya raha hoon, lagta hai ki astaghfirullah, mein jahannam hi aadmi hoon, Allah ta'ala musse khush nahi hai, or else I would be happy. Then why should I be religious? Why should I be attending religious circles? There's no hope. So all of these questions arise over and over again. And inshaAllah ta'ala, in today's brief remarks, the goal is to tackle these questions holistically. Now obviously, I cannot deconstruct every single one of these premises. I cannot give a detailed explanation about everything. But inshaAllah, the goal is to have a holistic response, especially through the life of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because in the end of the day, that's what we have. The Quran and the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sunnah, that's what we have. These are our sources. So let us look to the seerah. Let us understand what is the philosophy of trials and tribulations. Kyu parishaniya hai is dunya mein? Let us understand Okay, what is the purpose of the deen? Is it to overcome the parishaniya? Is it to eliminate all of these stress? Let us understand what did the Prophet said. Was he even in stress? Or did he live a stress-free life? And that's going to be some of the topics we're going to discuss, inshaAllah ta'ala, in today's brief module and seminar. So let us begin. The first point, we need to understand theologically, aqidatan, we need to understand that this world was created to be a world of stress. In fact, it is called in Arabic, Darul Ibtila. Urdu ka lafzana ibtila. Aap jante na ibtila. Dunya jo hai, Darul Ibtila. Azmaishon ka dar hai. Iska naam hi hai. This world is Darul Ikhtibar. Darul Imtihan. Imtihan bhi Urdu ka lafzana. This world is not meant to be the abode of peace. So we have to remove from our minds the misconception that we shall attain ultimate peace in this dunya. This is not the abode of ultimate peace. Kya aise koi dunya hai jis mein ultimate peace hai? Bilkul. Balki uska naam hai ultimate peace. Uska naam, us dunya ka naam hai ultimate peace in Arabic. Daru salam. Allah Ta'ala ne do dunya banai hai. Ye dunya aur ek aur dunya. 
یہ دنیا ہے دار الاختبار دار الابتلاء دار الامتحان اور وہ دنیا کا کیا نام ہے واللہ یدعو الى دار السلام اللہ تعالی تم کو برا رہا ہے کہاں بلا رہا ہے کس لیے برا رہا ہے کیا ڈیسٹینیشن کیا ہے واللہ یدعو الى دار السلام اللہ تم کو دار السلام بلا رہا ہے دار السلام کہاں ہے تنزانیہ کے کیپٹل دار السلام یہ جنت ہے دار السلام what does it mean دار السلام what does it mean سلام کا کیا مطلب ہے کیا کون بتائے گا سلام what does سلام mean peace صحیح ہے peace it's not wrong but there's a more technical definition of سلام there's a more technical definition of سلام سلام means the absence of evil that's really what سلام means Technically, now of course that is also peace, yeah. But salam means the absence of any grief, any anxiety, any stress. And so, listen to this carefully. Jannat is called Daru Salam because that is the abode where there's no stress. That's where you will get no pain, no suffering, no harm. نہ مسلم نہ کافر نہ جنی نہ انسی نہ مر نہ عورت کسی کو نہیں ultimate abode اگر مل جاتا تو جنت یہی آ جاتی پھر if a person found ultimate happiness in this دنیا وہی ہے دار السلام and this is not the abode of دار السلام the abode of دار السلام is the next one واللہ یدعو الى دار السلام and that is why when the people of جنہ enter جنہ جب جنت کے لوگ داخل ہوں گے جنت میں قرآن میں ہم کو بتایا گیا ہے سب سے پہلے ان کا جملہ کیا ہوگا جب وہ جنت میں تشریف لائیں گے جب وہ جنت میں انٹر ہوں گے داخل ہوں گے اور ملائکہ آتے رہیں گے والملائکہ تو ید خلون علیہ من کل باب سلام علیکم ملائکہ ہر دروازے سے اندر آ رہے ہوں گے ملائکہ سب کہیں سے آ کے ان کو سلام پیش کر رہے ہوں گے اہل و جنہ کیا بولیں گے سب سے پہلے جو ذکر ہے جنہ کا کون بتائے گا what is the first dhikr of jannah when the people of jannah enter jannah what is the first thing they will say when they enter jannah نہیں وہ تو اللہ تعالیٰ آپ سے بولے گا جنہ آپ سے بولیں گے what are you gonna say اللہ تعالیٰ بولے گا سلام yes سلام ان قولا من رب الرحیم right آپ کیا بولیں گے انشاءاللہ may Allah make us amongst them say امین may Allah make us amongst them what are we gonna say اللہ تعالیٰ کہتا ہے سورہ فاتر میں بتاتا ہے سورہ فاتر میں ہم کو بتاتا ہے کہ اہل جنت کا کیا لفظ کیا ذکر ہوگا when they first enter جنہ what is the ذکر that they say وقالوا الحمدللہ الذی اذہب عن الحزن الحمدللہ جس نے ہم سے سب پریشانیہ اب دور کر لیا ہے حزن اردو میں حزن اردو کا نہیں ہے it's not اردو right Hazan means parishani. Actually, my problem is Urdu and Arabic becomes conflated. That's my problem. I speak fluent Arabic. Sometimes I think an Arabic word is Urdu. Hazan means parishani. And the people of Jannah, will, will they say, Alhamdulillah, jisne sab parishaniya dur kar aaj. Now think about this. Think about this. When does a person say this? When they get their first job, Alhamdulillah, the other Hazan. When they get their first promotion, When they get married, when they have their first child, when do we say, Alhamdulillah, illadhi adhaba anna al-hazan. Aaj ke baad, koi parishaniya nahi hongi. Kab bolenge ye? Even qabr me daakhin nahi hoga, qiyamit ke din nahi hoga, sirf jab pehla ja aapka jo step hoga jannat ke andar, your first step in jannah, aapke dil se niklega, Alhamdulillah, ab koi parishaniya nahi. When will that happen? Darus Salaam. And that is why, dear brothers and sisters, that is why when you enter Jannah, somebody said, Salamun Salama, wo Allah Ta'ala bolega. Allah ka nami as salam hai, right? Allah Ta'ala jo hai, ka nami as salam hai. Al mu'min al qawi as salam al mu'min. And Allah Ta'ala daru as salam call kar raha hai. He's calling to daru as salam. And our religion is Islam. When we follow Islam and obey as salam to enter daru as salam, That is when As-Salam, who conveys Salam, all Salam comes from him. That is when As-Salam will say Salam to the people who are following Islam. And when As-Salam says Salam, 
how can any harm come to that person after as salam says salam and that is why allah says salam to the people entering jannah because when allah says salam how can there be any parishani after that you understand this point here right so we set up the whole stage as we say in english paradigm hum log ka kya hai ki is dunya mein ultimate khushi nahi milegi now does this mean चलो ठीक है फिर परेशानी गम ग्रीफ स्ट्रेस नहीं ये मेरा मकसद नहीं है आप इसको गलत मत समझिए आई एम नॉट सेइंग दैट द पर्पस ऑफ लाइफ इज टू हैव स्ट्रेस आई एम सेइंग द फर्स्ट थिंग यू रिमूव फ्रॉम योर माइंड दैट दिस एबोड इज द एबोड ऑफ अल्टीमेट पीस दैट्स नॉट गोइंग टू हैपन इस दुनिया में आपको 100% सलाम पीस नहीं मिलेगा तो फिर मकसद क्या है दीन का फिर मकसद क्या है इस्लाम का इससे क्या हम लोग को हासिल होगा क्या इस्लाम से पीस नहीं मिलता हम लोग को We're going to talk a little bit about this, but the goal is not to eliminate stress. The goal is to learn how to cope and minimize it. That's the goal. To learn how to cope and minimize. You shall not eliminate grief and stress from your life in this world. Take that as a rule. It doesn't matter who you are and anybody who thinks that there's a milestone of this dunya that will make them stress free. I am sorry not only do you not know the religion you do not even know human history nobody in human history has achieved happiness after achieving a worldly milestone how much do you want what money what sum do you want that will make you happy do you think that people who have that sum are automatically happy wallahi every person who's struggling financially wants to be a millionaire the millionaires want to be multimillionaires the multimillionaires want to be billionaires the billionaires want to be in the top 40 in the forbes list the top 40 in the forbes list always want to keep it up none of them are living stress free just because of their wealth none of them any other aspect of this dunya ibn taymiyah has an amazing amazing maxim he says anyone who tries to find ultimate happiness in other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the very object that he wants to find happiness in will also cause him stress the very object that he thinks will make him happy other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually cause him stress aap paise dekh lijiye jiske paas paise hain usi ko malum hai kitna stress hota hai paison se right marriage ko dekh lijiye bachcho ko dekh lijiye yes there is happiness in wealth there's happiness in marriage there's happiness in children but there is no ultimate happiness in any of these so we begin this entire complex series of questions by stating the goal is not to eliminate stress that is simply not possible for a human being neither this religion nor any other religion claims to do so and those that claim to for example like Buddhism fact of the matter is it doesn't work that way they they think eliminating stress is by removing every desire from your heart that's not human you're not a human if you have no aspirations you're not a human if you have nothing to look forward to so my point is that's not the goal the goal is to grapple with stress the goal is to understand why it's there and the goal is to minimize its pain on you to minimize its impact on you and to look forward to a greater goal to look forward to the day of no stress to look forward to the abode of no anxiety that's the purpose of religion to find comfort in believing in darus salam and to eventually make your way to darus salam that's the ultimate goal so then the next point we bring up then is why is this the case kyun aakhir is dunya darul ibtila darul ikhtiba darul imtihan why didn't allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just create us and give us you know peace in fact abhi zara sa ek tangent hai those who listen to my lectures you know i'm infamous for tangents right to yahi hamara uslub hai yahi hamara tariqa hai maaf kar dijiye lekin main to main nahi tabdil tabdil kar sakta hu uske bare mein mere ek aur tangent hai sun lijiye inshallah aap log ke liye it's not that relevant i hope it's not that relevant i hope and pray it's not uh, as relevant to you guys lekin duniya mein ek atheist revolution ho raha hai duniya mein agnosticism phail rahi hai aur bahut hi absurd ki baat hai ke zyada tar i don't know whether majority of countries in europe are actually leaving all religions norway mein 70% of the younger generation says they don't believe in god 70% 
America, where I'm from, one third of millennials, millennials means those about younger than 35, one third, one out of three, says they don't believe in organized religion. It's terrifying. Pure tarikh insani, entire human history, mein, kabhi nahi. We have seen anything close to these levels of godlessness and atheism. Very terrifying. Because when you don't believe in God, you have removed all higher authority and morality. And the world is going to go from bad to worse as we are seeing right now. Now, why, why am I talking about this right now? Because this whole issue of tests and trials, this whole issue of parishaniya and gham and duk is actually the number one cause of agnosticism and atheism. Survey shows, statistics show, Pew studies, if you know what that is. Why do people turn away from God? Why do people reject God? They say, in their opinion, that we wouldn't see any pain. We wouldn't see any harm, any evil. Why did this child get cancer? Why tsunami wave They say, again, please understand, I'm quoting them. I'm just explaining their issue and then responding to it, right? They say, That's what they say. How can God be so cruel? Massive population, right? They say, And of course, this then causes them to reject the concept of God. Now, this is a very deep topic, and I, I, I did go into a tangent. I'm going to answer it, don't worry. Just wanted, just wanted to point out, this topic actually is so deep, it is an entire branch of science and philosophy. It's an entire branch of theology. It's called theodicy. The topic of evil and God, and how do we understand a God who allows evil, or maybe even wills evil, is so complex that it is an entire discipline in the humanities. You can do a PhD in this entire discipline. In fact, PhDs have been done, and it goes back to the ancient Greek philosophers all the way down to our tradition, Christianity, Judaism. Thousands of theologians have attempted to grapple you know, with this, and I've given lectures about this. But we respond very simply by stating, what arrogance is it? To demand that just because you are created by a God, that you are owed eternal bliss by that God. They are literally demanding Jannah for free. And when they don't, because that's what they want, Darus Salam. It's exactly what they want. An abode of no pain and suffering. We already said Darus Salam. And when they don't get Jannah for free, well then, in their minds, khalas, we don't want to believe in this God. And that is the height of arrogance. And that's why I say atheism does not come from pseudo-scientific you know, problems or pseudo-intellectual problems. The root cause of atheism is very simple, spiritual arrogance. The root cause of rejecting God is spiritual arrogance. This notion that just because I exist, I deserve a full and perfect world. And if this world does not exist, well then in my arrogance, I shall reject the Creator. Because actually, think about it, listen to me carefully now, very, very deep, listen to this carefully. In fact, the entire notion of rejecting God, because you don't understand pain and evil and suffering and dukkh and gham and parishani, is actually intellectually flawed. It actually has nothing to do, this problem has nothing to do with their solution. The fact that you don't understand the wisdom of God, because that's what evil is, how to understand the wisdom of God, has nothing to do with the fact that God exists. Whether you understand or don't understand why Allah does something is separate to the proofs of His existence. Allah's existence is self-evident. Your existence is a proof of His existence. Your contemplation is a proof of His existence. Now, whether you don't understand or understand one particular aspect of the creation, you can say, I don't understand God's wisdom. Fully fair, I accept this. But for you to deny God's existence because you don't understand God's wisdom, this is philosophically, the syllogisms are false if you understand the terminology, right? They don't add up, has nothing to do with each other. 
And that's why I say it is arrogance. The max you can say, if you don't understand evil, I don't understand God's wisdom. Fair enough. And in fact, we will actually agree with you. Who are you that you assign for yourself the role of understanding God's wisdom? What is your infinitesimally minuscule mind capable of that you are taking on the challenge? Oh God, I shall understand every aspect of your creation. No. Allah says in the Quran, by the way, right? لا يسأل عما يفعل وهم يسألون. None has the moral authority to ask Allah why He does anything. لا يسأل عما يفعل. جو وہ کرتا ہے کوئی نہیں اس سے پوچھ سکتا کیوں کیا. لا يسأل عما يفعل وهم يسألون. بلکہ تم سے پوچھا جائے گا تم نے کیوں کیا جو تم نے کیا. The Quran is very clear. Who are you to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Hey Allah, kyun? How can you? Who are you? La yus'alu amma yaf'al. But that's exactly what the atheist does. Hey Allah, kyun? Nay samaj me ara? Tika, I'm going to reject you. This is satanic. Shaitan, literally. Because what did shaitan do? Hey Allah, why didn't the angels do sajda to me? Because they did it to Adam? Tika, I'm not going to worship you. Actually, Iblis was smarter than an atheist. Iblis rejected the worship of Allah, but not, not what? Not the existence of Allah. Iblis rejected the worship, but the premise is the same. He wanted a world where he was priority. He wanted a world according to his logic and wisdom. When he didn't get that, he goes, okay, I'm not going to worship you. As if, as if Allah needs Iblis' worship. The same mindset of the atheist, the agnostic. If the world is not the way I think it should be, then I'm going to reject God. As I said, goes back to arrogance. Now, next point here, we're moving on. I'm going to lose track of my points, so if you're writing these points down, then alhamdulillah, good for you. Next point that we're going to discuss, bismillah. <clears throat> and that is, does, does, being inflicted with pain and suffering, does having parishaniya mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not happy with you? That you are being chastised? That, that's it, khalas, it's all gone. Here, we get to an interesting point. For some strange reason, bohat zyada log yehi samajhte کہ اگر جو ہے ہماری زندگی میں مشکلات ہیں پریشانیاں ہیں اس کا مطلب ہے کہ اللہ مجھ سے غصہ ہے and I don't understand where this notion is coming from because it goes against the Quran it goes against the Sunnah it goes against not just the seerah of our Prophet it goes against the seerah of every Prophet of Allah what do I mean by this? what is the biography of every single Prophet Except one tragedy and one calamity and one, you know, major problem after another. What is the entirety of the seerah except our Prophet ﷺ seeing how difficult life was? He was born an orphan, thrice orphaned. From his birth, he was born an orphan. He was born with no silver spoon in his mouth. There was no wealth, inherited family. There was no wealth. There was no money for him. He was living with his grandfather, then tossed over to an uncle. Dirt poor, literally. No wealth at all. He was struggling throughout his life financially. No siblings, no brothers and sisters, no parents. In fact, even when he had a family, subhanAllah, Allah blessed him with seven children. Seven. Memorize their names. You should know them, by the way. And think about this. Brothers and sisters, Banor Bayo. Un saat bachon se che he buried with his own hands, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He lost every single son or daughter except for Bibi Fatima and she passed away six months after his death. He buried with his own hands every one of his children, six of his children in his lifetime. You're going to tell me he didn't have parishaniya and griefs? You're going to tell me his life was stress-free, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The persecution, the ridicule, you know more difficult than that? We think, and yes, for our states it's true, that the worst tragedy, the most difficult tragedy is to lose a child. And there's no doubt, yes, that is very true. 
May Allah protect our children and uh, uh, all of our families and, and, and their loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never allow us to see the tragedy. Those that have seen it, may Allah azza wa jalla make it a shafa'a for you and a means of, 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 of jannah for, for you for the sabr that you have done. Our Prophet ﷺ was asked by our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, what was the most difficult thing that you faced? What was the most difficult issue that you faced? He didn't say the death of my children. He didn't say, you know, Khadija ke wa Abul Abdullah. No. You know what it was most difficult instance of his life? He said the day that I stood in front of the people of Ta'if and they said to me what they said. He didn't even verbalize it. Because you see, for a man like our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, worse than the tragedy of physically being beaten, because he was beaten in Uhud. In fact, you know the actual question Aisha radiallahu anha asked him? Was there a day for you worse than Uhud? That's the actual question. Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Was there a day for you worse than Uhud? Because in her minds, what she had seen of the seerah, Uhud is clearly the worst experience. Twice almost or three times close to death. A spear, a javelin, his premolars taken out, the dislodgement of an entire weapon straight into his cheeks, the bleeding for days on end without stopping, the loss of Hamza, so much tragedy at Uhud. So he, she asked, was there a day worse than Uhud? Because in her mind, physical pain, body pain, and immediately he talks about a different type of pain. The pain of our Prophet ﷺ was not body, it was to be rejected as a prophet, his dignity as a prophet, to be accused astaghfirullah, of lying about his prophethood publicly, to be mocked by the entire city. You all know Ta'if, you all know what happened in Ta'if. I don't need to go over the details. That, he said, was the worst time. Notice, he didn't say, I'm a prophet, I don't have any grief and stress. He didn't say, my iman is so strong, I was never worried, I was never anxious, there was no pain in my life. Aisha radiallahu anha understood there is pain, and Aisha said, what is your worst day? Was there something worse than Uhud? Which means there's scales, there's a gradation, darajat. Yanekibas, no, multiple instances. So you see, dear brothers, dear sisters, the summary of this point before I move on, is actually a beautiful hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Write this hadith down and memorize it. In Arabic, إن الله تعالى إذا أحب قوم نبت لهم جب الله تعالى کسی سے محبت کرتا ہے وہ اس کو ابتلا میں ڈالتا ہے اس کو پریشانیوں میں ڈالتا ہے سمجھ لیجئے جب اللہ تعالى کسی سے محبت کرتا ہے What does he do? فردوس یہیں لے کر آ جاتا ہے یہیں پہ دار السلام یہیں پہ پریشانیاں دور No! Exact opposite! إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَىٰ إِذَا أَحَبَّ قَوْمًا نِبْتَ لَهُمْ إِبْتِلَىٰ زِيَادَ هُتِي هَيْهُنْ كِي اُوپَر Why? What's the purpose? We learn because Allah wants to reward them with the highest of the high. Allah wants to give them the firdaus up there. And in order to get the firdaus up there, well then, you must pass the exams down here. You have to get extra credit. And an easy life is not going to give you extra credit. Do you understand this point? An easy life is not going to give you extra credit. If you really want the highest exam, the best grades, you're going to have to go above the curriculum more than the syllabus. You're going to have to do projects nobody else does. You're going to have to hand in assignments, be late in the lab doing whatever you're doing. Do much more than anybody else and then the teacher will reward you the way you deserve. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really wants to reward you, when Allah wants to take you to the highest of the high, well then, you're going to have to put in the effort over here. And that effort is done primarily by increasing the quantity and quality of the tests. And that's exactly what our Prophet ﷺ said and his whole life demonstrated. Another hadith of Sahih Muslim. The most highest tests that are given are given to the Prophets and then those after them and then those after them. 
جو یہ سمجھتا ہے کہ اگر ہم دیندار ہو جائیں گے اگر ہم نمازی ہو جائیں گے اگر ہم پرہزگار ہو جائیں گے اس کا مطلب ہے ہمارے سب پریشانیاں دور ہو جائیں گے اس کا مطلب ہے اس نے نہ قرآن پڑھا نہ سیرت پڑھا نہ اینی بایوگرافی آف دا صحابہ اینی آف دا میجر اسکالرس دیٹس ناٹ دا وے لائف ورکس دوز ہوم اللہ سبحان و تعالی لوز دے شیل بی ٹیسٹیڈ مور Not because Allah wants to show adab, but because Allah wants to raise their ranks. Now, question here. Kya iska matlab hai ki hum phir poochhe Allah Ta'ala se ki Allah Ta'ala humko zyada parishaniya dije? Obviously not. So, here's the point. By the way, are you guys all paying attention? Is my Urdu decent enough? Guzara ho raha hai? Thik thak hai? Pass ya fail? Achhi baat hai, chali alhamdulillah. دیکھیے میں ایکسن بھی پاس کر رہا ہوں پاس اور فیل پاس یا فیل یہ بھی ایکسن بھی کرنا ہوتا ہے اور اردو میں جب بات کرتے ہیں انگریزی کی انگلش ایکسن اردو ایکسن اس میں بھی ہم کو پاس کرنا ہے اوتھینٹک اردو انگلش اچھا میں کیا کہہ رہا تھا وہ ذائی سینگ وہ ذائی سینگ گائز ٹرین آف تھاٹ جی ہاں صحیح بات ہے تو کیا اس کا مطلب ہے کہ ہم اللہ تعالیٰ سے مانگیں کہ اے اللہ تعالیٰ مجھ کو آپ زیادہ ابتلا میں ڈالیے نہیں سن لیجیے یہ بات اٹس اے ویری ٹیکنیکل پوائنٹ سو سیٹ ان انگلش سو آئی ڈونٹ میس اپ اٹس اے ویری ٹیکنیکل پوائنٹ اوکے لسن ٹو دس وی ڈو ناٹ وانٹ ٹو بی ٹیسٹیڈ مور دین ادرس وائی بیکاز وی آر اسکیئرڈ آف پوٹینشیلی فیلنگ دا ٹیسٹ وی ڈونٹ وانٹ ٹو بی ٹیسٹیڈ مور دین ادرس بٹ لسن ٹو می کیئرفلی اف Allah chooses us for a test. Well then, we take it as a badge of honor. Once the test is announced, then our iman has to kick in. And our courage and our taqwa and our yaqeen and our ikhlas has to shine. It's literally like in the Imagine in front of an army and the general is saying, I'm going to choose one warrior to go and start the fight. The bravest, the best. Now, on the one side, everybody does not want to be that warrior. On the other side, as soon as the general announces, this is the man I've chosen. What an honor for that man. Legends are going to be created. His name shall go down forever. That was the man that was chosen. You understand this point here, right? Before the name is called... I don't want to be that guy. Once it is called, well then, it's been assigned to you. And in fact, we learned this exactly from the hadith. Beautiful hadith. Amazing hadith, also in Sahih Muslim. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that none of you لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو تم خواہش مت کرو How do I do this? خواہش مت کرو دشمن سے ملاقات کرنے کے لیے Battle field. What's the battle field? جنگ میدان جنگ دس واٹ واز لکنگ فار رائٹ تم یہ خواہش مت رکھو ڈونٹ ڈیزائر بائی دا وے ہی سیٹ دس بیفور دا بیٹل بیفور دا بیٹل آف بدر ڈونٹ ہیو دا ڈیزائر بیفور دا بیٹل آف بدر واز ایکچولی ڈیسائڈیڈ ون دیر واز اے پاسبلٹی یو سی ڈونٹ ڈیزائر ٹو میٹ دی اینمی آن دا میدان جنگ بٹ اف اٹ ہیپنس دیٹ یو آر فیسنگ دیم دین اسٹک یور فیٹ فرم and fight courageously. Think of the philosophy. Think of the paradigm here. Don't desire because you don't know whether you're going to pass or fail. You don't want to take on extra. But if Allah has chosen for you that, hey, you're going to fight Badr. If Allah has chosen for you, those are the Quraysh and you're going to fight them. Well then, khalas, uthbutu. Yani ke be firm. Show some courage and stamina. This is our mindset. That's why we don't ask Allah for ibtila. We ask Allah for the exact opposite. What is the opposite? Al-afiyah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-afiyah. Memorize this dua. Our Prophet taught it to his uncle Al-Abbas. Oh Allah, we ask you for al-afiyah. Al-afiyah means to not be tested. So we ask Allah because we don't want to be tested. But... When we are tested, then we recognize, okay, Allah has chosen me. And if Allah has chosen you, then my next point here, m- m- memorize this rule as well. It's a Quranic rule. The fact that Allah has chosen you 
means that you are qualified to pass the test. Uh, hold on a sec, that signed for 10 minutes? Where's the, Roman bhai? What 10 minutes? I'm literally not even 10% in the lecture. <laughs> oh, not the end of the lecture. Okay, okay, okay. Daradi aapne bhai sahab. Abhi se 10 minute khatam ho gaya, abhi to shuru bhi nahi kya. Ye to literally mera 10% hoa, aapke ne 10 minute rahe gaya. Okay, koi baat nahi. The fact that Allah has chosen you means that Allah has already given you the tools to pass the test. یہ کسی کو نہیں سمجھنا چاہیے کہ میں یہ نہیں کر سکتا ہوں کسی کو نہیں سمجھنا چاہیے when you're in a calamity when you're in a مصیبہ when the tragedy happens let nobody think this is above me یہ میں نہیں کر سکتا یہ میں برداشت نہیں کر سکتا ہوں نہیں 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 a thousand times نہیں بالکل غلط ہے آپ برداشت کر سکتے ہیں اور آپ برداشت کریں گے how do I know this Allah says in the Quran لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. إسكا كيا مطلب؟ What does it mean? لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. There shall be no test put upon you except that you are capable of passing that test. So the fact that you are being tested means Allah knows you can pass the test. Allah does not set you up for failure. Allah does not set you up for failure. Yes, your professors can do so. Yes, your exams can give a question you're not prepared for. But Allah will never give you a life question. Allah will never give you a life problem that you don't have the solution for. Do you understand this point? You are not being set up for failure. You are being set up for a test, no doubt about that. But you have within you the means to pass the test. You have what it takes. You have the stamina. You have the courage. You have the iman. Or you shall have the iman. Whatever is happening, you're going to be able to pass it. Because Allah Azza wa Jal does not play games. Allah does not do something batil for no reason. Allah does not set up people for failure. So realize this point as well. That tests are going to happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall test you. And the purpose of those tests, the goal for those tests is to rise up in ranks and to achieve the reward and pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we said, the wisdom of trials, the wisdom of tests, the wisdom of pain is what? لِيَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ So that Allah can separate the good from the evil, the pure from the impure. Allah can separate the grade A from the failures and yes, even from the just barely passing C minuses. In the end of the day, you have to do something to get up there. And what is done in this dunya will affect what your daraja is up there. And of the primary mechanism, now by the way, it's not just you know, difficult tests. Everything in life is going to help us to get up there. Everything in life, how we live, you know, how we act, our interest. It's not just the calamities, but calamities and problems and anxieties and stress is one of the most difficult and also most rewarding bonus points. Do you get it? A lot of bonus points are one or two. Calamities, what is the daraja of the calamity? What is the bonus point of the calamity? إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ There is no number put on passing the test of anxiety. There is no number put. It's بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ And that is one of the only things that is بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Do you guys understand this point? Most things in life, if you do something, you will get an equation. You give one rupee, you get 10 rupees good. You pray one rakah, you know, 10 rakah. You read one ayah, you, there's an equation. Some things, no equation. Bighayri hisab. And of them, to have sabr during tragedies. This means tragedies, anxieties, parishaniya. Yes, it's difficult. That's why it's difficult. But the potential for getting good marks it is possible that one parishani, one anxiety can erase a lifetime of sin if you deal with it correctly. One major stress, one issue can potentially absolve a lifetime of evil if you deal with it correctly. And that's why it's so important to understand this point. One final point before we give, when you say break, by the way, Noman Bhai, what do you mean break? They're just going to stand up and sit down or? 
Basically, that's it. That, well, guys, do you need that break? Yar, by ijma. Okay. It, it doesn't make any sense to me because I can't send you out and come back in. You're not going to come back in. So whoever wants to stand up and sit down, you may do so. No problem, okay? I'm standing the whole time. No problem, inshallah. Okay. Another point that, that comes up is the issue of, well then, how do I know if the test is a punishment or a blessing? How do I know that Allah wants to raise my ranks versus Allah is angry with me and actually you know, getting rid of my sins or whatnot. Because in the end of the day, there is something called adab of this dunya. In the end of the day, there are people who are punished in this world before they're punished in the hereafter. So a legitimate question, humko kaise maroom hai ki ye hamare gunahon ki wajah se hai ya kya Allah taala humko jo hai isse hum hamari darajat baland karna cha raha hai? It's a valid question. The response is, why are you thinking of it as an either or? It's both. It's both. Listen to me carefully. It is both. If you answer the question properly. You are being quote unquote punished for some of the sins that you have done so that you are cleansed from those sins. And so that you don't have anything on the day of judgment. And yes, so that your ranks are then raised up. If you have the right attitude, then is the multiple choice all the correct answers above? That's what it becomes. Everything is valid for you. Which means every single point of stress, calamity, grief, every pain, physical and mental, every anguish, yes, it's because of something I have done, you have done. Allah says so in the Quran. وَمَا أَصَابَكُم مِّن مُصِيبَةٍ Whatever musibah happens to you, فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ It's because of what your own hands have done. كُلَا كُلَمْ صَافْ بَاتَ جو تم میں مصیبت نازل ہوتی ہے چونکہ تم نے کچھ خود کچھ کیا اسی وجہ سے مصیبت آئی ہے لیکن اس کے بعد کیا کہتے ہیں اللہ تعالی ویری نیکسٹ فریز کیا ہے وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٌ اس مصیبت کے وجہ سے اللہ تعالی بہت زیادہ گناہ معاف کرتا ہے اسی کے بعد بالکل سیم آیا میں ہے وی سٹاپ رائٹ دیر وی ڈونٹ موو آن دا پرپس از ناٹ پین and punishment. The purpose is kafara. The purpose is the opportunity to repent and raise your ranks. So, yes, you are being quote-unquote punished, but don't call it a punishment. Call it an expiation. Kafara for your sins. Think of it as a cleansing. And the purpose of the cleansing is to raise your ranks up. We all have sins. We all have our sins. So when a calamity happens, what did our Prophet say? Hadith is in Bukhari. No pain or grief or anxiety or suffering. Literally four things are mentioned. No ham or huzn or alam. No, you know, dil ki jo, you know, a prob, uh, anguish hoti hai, or physical bodily pain. Nothing happens to the believer. So much so, even a thorn that pricks him. Except that Allah uses that to forgive his sins. Hadith is in Bukhari. So yes, whatever problem happens, you have done something. But Allah is not sending this punishment down in order to punish you and in order to send you down to Jahannam. No, Allah is giving you the opportunity. You know, this is Pakistan, right? You guys used to play, I used to play when I was a kid. Uh, what is it? Snakes and ladders, right? You guys still play that game or is that from the 70s and 80s? You still play it? Every musibah. Urdu mein kya kehte hain usko? Huh? Ludo. Saap siri. Saap siri kehte hain usko. Saap siri. No exact. Think of this literally. As a musibah is basically that ladder. That's literally what every musibah is. It's that ladder. You get a free upgrade if you pass it. You're going to raise yourself ranks. But only if you pass it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down those calamities because yes, I have done something, you have done something. So rather than face it in the akhirah, which is a bit much bigger problem, rather than face it on yawm al-hisab, 
Rather than be punished by the worst punishment, Allah is saying, okay, I'll get rid of it now. Don't worry. You shall come on the day of judgment, as the hadith says, squeaky clean, blank slate. How can you have a blank slate? Because your anxieties and stress has acted like an eraser. It has wiped away all of the sins you've done. But on top of that, on top of that, Allah will give you something in the other basket, the hasanat basket. So the sayyat, the evil basket, eraser. And the hasanat basket, good deeds. What other thing can do this other than calamities and grief? So, am I being punished for a sin that I committed? Well, don't call it punishment. Call it kafara, expiation. And then use it to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Use it to reassess your life. Use it to turn over a new leaf. Memorize this rule, brothers and sisters. Memorize this. Every calamity, every tragedy that brings you closer to Allah, Wallahi, it is not a tragedy. It is a divine gift Allah has gifted you with. Because nothing is more important than closeness to Allah. Nothing. So, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala realized that your heart is polluted, you love someone, something too much. You're distracted by something. And so Allah took that thing away. Whether it was money, whether it was wealth, whether it was status, whether it was a human being. And Allah took that thing out of your life. And because of that, you crumble to the ground. You seem broken. But then you had to stand up slowly and surely. You had to rebuild your life. You had to start from scratch. And in the process, you became a new you. You became version two of you. A version far more powerful, far more spiritual, far more connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How could you not see Allah wanted to gift you? Allah wanted to cause you to stand up and he could only do that by causing you to crumble to the ground because you were too blind, you were too conceited, you were too deluded by whatever deluded you. So Allah took away that delusion. Allah removed that illusion so that you could humanize yourself and become a worshiper of him. Anything that brings you closer to Allah is a blessing in disguise. So never ever think of a tragedy that brings you closer to Allah as a tragedy. In fact, in fact, let me ask you a very deep spiritual question. Go look at your entire life, whether in your 20s, whether in your 50s, whether in your 80s, go look at your entire life. And I ask you one question, at what point in your life, other than Hajj and Umrah, at what point in your life did you feel the closest to Allah? Chances are, 9 out of 10, you're going to think of a very stressful time of your life. Chances are, you're going to think when somebody died, your child was sick, you're going through a divorce, some issue is troubling you more than anything else. And it caused you to rekindle a latent spirituality. A spirituality maybe even you didn't know existed. Maybe even it shocked you how spiritual you became. And because of that tragedy, something emerged from the depths of your heart. And what happened after the tragedy was very different than the you before the tragedy. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is the wisdom of why Allah tests us. We don't believe in a sadistic God like these agnostics say. We don't believe in the God of pain and punishment. We believe in the God who is Arham al Rahimin, who is Malik, who is Kareem, who is Manan, who is Wadud. We believe in Allah who is Rahman and Rahim. So the purpose of pain is not pain. The purpose of grief and anxiety is not to see us humble. No, it's to see us to be freed from this dunya and what was hampering us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the whole point of this reality of spirituality and this shows us therefore my next point i get i don't know which number we're on but my next point therefore once we understand all this our prophet was tested he was tested more than anybody else our prophet acknowledged being tested our prophet acknowledged the pain in his heart the quran itself mentions his pain by the way before we move on another point we can mention those who claim that let me bring back myself to Urdu. I defaulted to my American self. I am Pakistani in the core, don't worry. 
have to discover that latent Pakistaniness, bring it out too. What we say is that the people of the world are not going to be able to do it. If you have a good faith, اگر آپ جو ہے متقی آدمی ہے اس کا مطلب ہے کہ آپ کو پریشانی نہیں ہوگی اینڈ دے کم ٹو اینڈ دے سی وائی آر یو ڈپریسڈ اس کا مطلب آپ کے پاس ایمان نہیں ہے وائی آر یو ان اسٹریس آپ کو کیوں غم میں پریشانی ہے اس کا مطلب آپ کا ایمان کیا تازہ نہیں ہے تازہ نہیں ہے کمزور ہے اوکے وٹ از تازہ نہیں ناٹ فریش سوری اوکے اٹس ناٹ فریش کمزور ہے آپ کا ایمان کمزور ہے سم بڑی از گن کم ٹو یو ہاؤ مینی ٹائمز آف یو ہرڈ دس اگر آپ کے پاس ایمان ہوتا تو پھر یہ آپ اس پہ پریشانی ہوتے کیا آپ کے پاس ایمان نہیں ہے یو می یو می ٹو فیل گلٹی فار فیلنگ سیڈ اے پرسن ہو از لیل بٹ ریلیجیس ڈیفنیٹلی ناٹ نالجبل اے لیل بٹ ریلیجیس کزن ریلیٹو ہی از گن اے گلٹ ٹرپ یو یو ڈونٹ ہیو ایمان اف یو فیلنگ سیڈ کیوں پریشانی کیوں ہے آپ ایمان ہے سبحان اللہ اللہ ٹیلز اس ان دا قرآن لسن ٹو دس ولا قد نعلم انك يضيق صدرك بما يقولون اي نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم حمكو معلوم ہے کہ تمہارے دل میں دکھ ہے چونکہ وہ تمہارے بارے میں جو کہتے ہیں کہتے ہیں اس کی وجہ سے تمہارے دل میں دکھ ہے ولا قد نعلم انك يضيق صدرك بما يقولون ضيق الصدر انگلش میں ہم بولیں گے your heart is at stress literally لٹرلی اسٹریس فل ہارٹ کس وجہ سے لوگ کہہ رہے ہیں کچھ میئر ٹاک اینڈ اللہ فرام اب دا سیون ہیون از ریویلنگ ان دا قرآن سب کو معلوم ہو جائے اینڈ بائی دا وے بائی دا وے ٹینجنٹ یور ادر تربیہ پوائنٹ سائیکولوجیکل پوائنٹ ٹو افرم دا پین آف سم بڑی ان پین از اے فارم آف تھراپی Learn this from the Quran. To validate the pain. I know it's difficult. That right there, you must be going through a lot. I, I can only sense how it's just to validate the pain. Allah didn't guilt trip the Prophet. Allah didn't say, You don't have Astaghfirullah. I'm just saying Astaghfirullah. You don't have Iman. You get my point here, right? Allah is validating the grief. وَلَقَدَ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ ہم اچھی طرح جانتے ہیں وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمْ تَوْكِيدْ عربی میں We know ya رسول اللہ We know it's painful Why? Why? Why is Allah saying that? Because this is therapeutic This is therapeutic یعنی کہ ہم یہ کہہ سکتے ہیں لٹرلی ہم کہہ سکتے ہیں کہ اللہ تعالی اپنے نبی کو تسلی دے رہا ہے Literally we can say this How so? By validating The grief in his heart. This is therapy. Hey, Nabi, we know that your heart is a pain because they are saying what they are saying. And what is the other thing? 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 The word baqa'a, baqa'a, the word baqa'a means to become so stressed out that you might even die because of the grief. You might even die because the stress is overwhelming. And Allah says in the Quran, okay, your stress, Ya Rasulullah, is so much, it might cause your demise in your eagerness that they accept Iman and Islam. So much stressed out. Allah is telling him no. And that's why, by the way, this is early Makkan, Surah Surah Al-Kahf, mid Makkan, early Makkan. That's why the Quran is full of, look, you don't have to guide them. You just have to. إِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغُ وَعَلَيْنَ الْحِسَابُ That's why he's being told, you don't have to take the responsibility of guiding others. That's not your... Tuk is right? Tuk? Responsibility. That's not your Tuk, right? Your responsibility. Zimidari. That's not your Zimidari. It's not your zimidari that they're guided. Your zimidari is what? إِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ balag To convey the message. Remove yourself from the responsibility, Arabic ham, the, 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 the burden of guiding them. Your responsibility, بَلَاغُ mubin. The point is, what I was going to say, this notion that if you had iman, you wouldn't have dilka duk, completely wrong. Completely wrong. 
بلکہ کیا ہم لوگ کو صاحب سیرت سے کیا ثابت ہوتا ہے ہمارے حضور صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کو آف کورس ہی واس گریفٹ اسٹریسڈ آف کورس ہی واس ناؤ سم بڈیز گن سے ہاں نہیں یہ تو صرف آخرت کے اوپر ان کو اسٹریس تھا دنیا میں کچھ اسٹریس نہیں تھا اگین سبحان اللہ آئی ڈونٹ نو وچ بک آف سیرت دے ریڈنگ حدیث ان صاحب بخاری وین دا پروفیس لاسٹ زید ابن حارثہ And who is Zayd ibn Haritha? And what will make you understand who is Zayd ibn Haritha? Zayd ibn Haritha, is that for me? Zayd ibn Haritha, secret note by the way, okay. Dekhye bhai sahab, Q&A in 10 minutes nahi ho sakta, I'm sorry. I, I can't do it, I'll have to wrap up very much in 15-20 minutes, then Q&A after that, okay? So actually, um, to be honest, the, the lecture is much longer than this, but it's, um, I'll have to squeeze it in. No matter what, we'll do something, inshallah. Where was I? Where was I? Where was I? See? Where was I? That's not what you say. Where was I? Okay. Word order varies from language to language. Subject, verb, noun, object, verb, subject, all of these are all different permutations. And Urdu and English are very different, despite the fact, as you all know, if you listen to my lectures, Urdu and English are actually cousins, if you know, if you've listened to my lectures. Urdu and English are from the same language family, Proto-Indo-European. And that's why so many Urdu-English words are exactly the same, because Urdu and English are distant cousins, believe it or not. They go back to the same original language, unlike Arabic which is a totally different language. So we say haunt and hand. We say daunt and tooth. Believe in us, the same thing. We say upper and upper, and the words keep on going on and on. Anyway, so what I was saying, what was I saying? <laughs> Zayd ibn Haritha was, of course, the famous, quote-unquote, adopted son of the Prophet before adoption became haram, right? He raised Zayd as a child. He considered Zayd to be his son. Then Allah said, no, you know, uh, calling somebody your son. So Zayd became Zayd ibn Haritha. The Prophet loved him immensely. And he loved him like a son. And he treated him like a son. He even called him his son for 20 years of his life until Allah revealed Surah Al-Ahzab. And then Zayd passed away. One athar about Aisha will tell you who Zayd is, radiallahu anha. Aisha radiallahu anha nikah farmaya. Jab, jab huzoor sallam ka intiqal huwa ta, jab ka intiqal huwa ta, عائشہ نے فرمایا اگر زید ابھی زندہ ہوتے تو کوئی ہمارے والد کو نہیں چنتا زید کے اوپر ابو زید زید کے اوپر انسٹیڈ آف زید اگر زید زندہ ہوتے نو ون ووڈ ہیو چوزن مائی فادر اوور زید زید ووڈ بی نمبر ون مائی فادر ووڈ بی نمبر ٹو دس از عائشہ ہر سب سینگ دیٹ ول گیو یو ہو زید از فار دوز آف یو ہو ڈونٹ نو ہو زید از He's the only Sahabi Allah mentions by name in the Quran. Even Abu Bakr radiallahu an is mentioned with a proper pronoun. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ is Abu Bakr. As for Zayd, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وَطَرَى Zayd is in the Quran by name. Surah Al-Ahzab. Zayd passed away in the battle of Mu'tah. Zayd passed away in the battle of Mu'tah. And Aisha radiallahu anha was seeing the Prophet ﷺ describing the Battle of Mu'tah. This is one of the Mu'jizat. Mu'jizat. The Battle of Mu'tah took place in Tabuk, 900 you know, uh, kilometers away, or what, 900, 500 miles away from Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ is in Medina, and the battle is taking place above Tabuk. And he's giving a live play-by-play. Live. As it's happening, He's standing in the masjid, everybody's listening. One of the mu'jizat. And he sees the death of Zayd ibn Haritha and Abdullah ibn Rawaha and Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. All three of them died. The Battle of the Mu'tah, go listen to my seerah or read a book, listen to the Battle of the Mu'tah. Aisha says, when the news of Zayd and his killing reached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, listen to this, listen to this. He sat down out of grief. Tears began coming from his eyes and you could see the pain from his face. Is anybody going to tell me that if you have a calamity and you feel stressed that you don't have iman? Can anybody dare say, if you have iman, you don't have Which seerah are they reading? 
Now, true, the Prophet rarely cried, but he cried. He cried as a human being. This is not the only time he cried, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hadith is on Sahih Bukhari. When Ibrahim, his son, was dying, gasping for breath, and he, was, he passed away in his hand. Ibrahim was there, two years old, year and a half old. He passed away in his hand, in, holding on to him. Godi mit, aapke godi mit, literally. And Ibrahim passes away. Usi vakht, aap sallam ke aasu behna shuru kar gaye the. Literally crying. One of the sahaba said, listen to this. Kya aap bhi rote hain, Rasulullah? Awa tab ki ant, aap bhi rote hain. So they hadn't seen him cry that much. Right? But still, he's crying. You know what he said? Arabi mein kehta hoon, arudhi mein kehta hoon. Yes, ha, naam. Al-buka'u rahmatun. Rona jo hai, Allah ta'ala ka rahmat hai. Jo apne ibadon ke qulub mein daalta hai. We can say in English, crying is therapeutic. And Allah blesses you with the mechanism of crying so that you feel at ease. Buka'u rahmatun. Buka, rona, rahma. So anybody who tells you that if you had iman, you wouldn't feel stressed. You wouldn't feel grief. You wouldn't cry. I'm sorry, they're wrong. They're just plain wrong. The fact that you're stressed out is not a negation of your iman. True, your iman should help you cope with the stress. Agreed. But it's not going to eliminate the stress. It's not going to get rid of it. You're still going to cry when tragedy happens. You're going to feel anxious when, you know, your, 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 your finances have a take a turnover. Things are going to go south. Your emotions are also going to go south. That's natural. But, move on to our next point. And I don't have to wrap up in 10 minutes, inshallah. I can't, Baisa, because I have a... Huh? <laughs> okay, inshallah. Uh, I, I was told today is Shadi days. You're exactly going to go to Shadi's on Fridays and whatnot. So that's what I was told, you know. I'm like, Shadi shuru hoti hai, saare no baje, amerika mein toh khatam hoti hai, saare no baje, ghar jana hoti hai, bhai. Aap loko toh schedule hi bilkul mukhtalif hai. Anyway, we have earlier evenings there. So... <clears throat> The fact that you feel grief and pain, the fact that you cry, the fact that, listen to this, the Prophet sat down. Do you understand what that means? He's overcome with stress. Physically, he had to sit down. The news was overpowering, as you say in English. Is this a lack of iman? Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Akhir ham log insan hai, wo bhi insan te. He's lost Zaid. It takes time to process. And that time to process and heal, crying, stress, sit down. Move on to the next point. Now, one of the things we learn from the seerah, one of the things we learn from the seerah is when calamity strikes, when tragedy falls on you, you need to connect to Allah as soon as possible. This connection will help you cope with the stress. And the longer you delay the connection, now I'm, I'm not going to mince my words. I'm not going to mince my words now. I'm going to speak bluntly now. The longer you delay your connection, the weaker your iman. Yes, that is true. This I'm not going to sh change. This is very clear. To feel stressed, to cry, to sit down, to become overcome with emotion, not a sign of iman. All of it is legit. It doesn't affect your iman and the status of your iman. And people are different. Some people cry for different things. No problem. Some people cry for this. Okay. But the time lag between hearing of the tragedy and connecting with Allah, this is a sign of iman. The shorter the lag, the stronger the iman. The longer the lag, the weaker the iman. Is that clear? So the initial shock of tragedy, the initial overcoming of grief is not a sign of iman or lack thereof. But how long it takes you to think of Allah and to condition yourself what is going on and to bring in basic aqidah, basic theology. Because here is where Iman helps you cope with stress. How so? 
We just talked about why we are tested. We talked about the wisdom of tests. We talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanting to raise your rank. So the faster you remind yourself of all of this, the easier it becomes. Not eliminate, the easier it becomes to cope. And that is why Allah says in the Quran, you all know the verse, brothers and sisters, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Allah tells you in the Quran, those whom when the musibah comes down, they immediately say, Foran, unki zaban se nikalta hai. Foran, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. No lag time. And this is exactly, subhanallah, our process in Godi mein, Ibrahim ka intiqal ho raha hai. Ibrahim unke bethe te, intiqal ho raha hai. Ussi vakht jen tiqal hua, ussi vakht aapke zaban se nikla. إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ اُسِّي وَقْ نِكْلَى يَا إِبْرَاهِيمِ إِنَّا عَلَى فِرَاقِكَ لَمَحْزُومُنُونَ We are so sad you have left us. And he said, the eyes cry. وَإِنَّا الْعَيْنَ لَتَدْمَعُ وَإِنَّا الْقَلْبَ لَتَحْزَنُ حدیث میں ہے بخاری میں ہمارا دل جو ہے بالکل پریشانی سے بھرا حزن یعنی دکس یعنی anxious grief آنکھیں سے آنسو نکل رہی ہیں He said this میرے آنکھیں سے آنسو نکل رہی ہیں میرے دل میں جو ہے وہ گریف ہے لیکن جو غم ہے لیکن اپنے زبان سے ہم کیا بولیں گے اِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ اس کو ہم کہتے ہیں ایمان ایمان does not eliminate the غم it does not eliminate the آنسو but it connects you with Allah and when you are connected with Allah it helps deal with the tragedy not eliminate not get rid of, but you begin to cope. Hadith ma ata. Huzur sa sam chal rahe the Madina me, aur ek aurat wahan pe baithi thi, khabar ke samne, ro rahi thi. Uska miya hoga koi hoga, ro rahi thi. To Huzur sa sam ne farmaya, her back was to him. Huzur sa sam ne farmaya ke, e Allah ke bandi, ya amat Allah, e Allah ke bandi, sabar karo, sabar karo. Allah Taala inshaAllah tum ko ajar dega, jo bhi musibat aayi hai. Usne piche ke taraf nahi dekha. اس نے بس غصے میں کہہ دیا تم کون ہو چلے جاؤ یہاں سے الیکا عنی very struck she didn't recognize by the way obviously چلے جاؤ دفعہ ہو جاؤ یہاں سے تم کون ہو تم کو کیا معلوم ہے کہ یہ مصیبت کتنی مطلب how big is it for me تم کو کیا معلوم ہے who are you to tell me anything can you imagine somebody said this to the process of them but she didn't know right she didn't know she was like didn't look behind the process of them گزار گئے مسجد میں چلے گئے اس کے بعد Sahabi aaye, kya tum bhaagolo, were you crazy? You lost your mind? Do you not know who that was? Koon tha wo? What the Huzur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said? Immediately, oh my God, bhaage bhaage gai, masjid, ya Rasulallah, ya Rasulallah, maaf kar dijay, mein na aapko pechana nahi. Mein na aapko pechana nahi. Huzur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ne kya farmaya? Bilkul frank. Neither did he, he's not, he's not offended personally. لیکن he said the truth انما الصبر عند صدمت الاولى this is a simple rule صبر دکھایا جاتا ہے at the first stroke of the calamity اس وقت آپ صبر دیکھ سکتے ہیں صبر کب دکھا جاتا ہے not 10 days later واللہ عجیب چیز ہے بہنو بھائیو عجیب چیز ہے اللہ تعالی نے کیسے ہم لوگ کو create کیا ہے کہ برے سے برہ disaster دس دن کے بعد ایک سال کے بعد we cope with it but it's a but a disaster. We learn to cope with it. Like in the first day, the first hours, that's the most difficult, correct? And this is what our Prophet is saying. Ye jo vakht hai, isi vakht sabr dikhaya jata hai. You want to show what is sabr? Show me right when the calamity happens. So, we talked about that lag time, correct? Ye hadith mein ye sabit hota hai. This is called weak iman. This is called weak iman. She took a long while. And in that interim, she did what she did. Last two points, inshallah ta'ala, and then we'll open the philosophy of the Q&A. The second to last point. Okay, so we talked about so many different, you know, philosophy, wisdom, and pain and suffering, and the process of being tested, and, you know, feeling grief and tragedy, and, uh, you know, the fact that it's a, a, a means of expiation. Now, we talked about connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turning to Him, 
feeling that understanding the wisdom of why tests occur, knowing that you shall pass the test if you want to pass it. You have the means, you have the mechanism, you have the iman, you have the tools, it's all within you. Allah has given it to you. Now, what does that mean, all of this then? That we just sit back and that's it, do nothing? That, okay, well, Allah is going to test me. This means he's going to cause me to pass the test. Okay, now we get to our second to last point. And that second to last point is as follows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed shall take care of you. And Allah will help you. But only if you actively seek his help and you physically go in pursuit of change. You must put in the effort. You must be active in trying to eliminate or minimize the source of that grief. For example, you've lost some money. You're in a financial crisis. Okay, that's painful. Well then, figure out other ways to earn money. You lost a job. Very difficult. Don't just sit at home and mope and grope and dope. No. Write up your resumes and send them everywhere. Go knocking on doors. Go ask people. Or get another skill set. You cannot sit at home and expect miracles to fall down from the heavens. The seerah teaches us. The Prophet was never inactive just waiting for a miracle. He kept on pursuing avenues of change. He kept on proverbially knocking on doors. And ironically, every door that opened up was not a door he was searching for. But because he was knocking on all the doors, some door opens up and that door turns out to be the best door. This is the spirit of Islam. Islam does not teach you to be theologically lazy, that you sit back and say, Allah sab take care of Allah. Yes, Allah will take care only if you put in the effort to show you want it to be taken care of. We don't believe in doing nothing and expecting a miracle. We actively engage to change the circumstances we find ourselves in. And this also means that even our grief and tragedies, we actively engage in trying to minimize them after a while. Because, see, there's two types of tragedies. There's one that you can change in the sense losing a job. Well, get another job, okay? You know, a financial issue, okay? Find another mechanism out. Going through a bad divorce, it's a very sad thing. Yes, then if you want to get married, get married again. Fine, you actively change. And then there are other things, for example, losing a loved one. Well, you can't get the loved one back, can you? Correct? It's not going to happen. But we still actively try to overcome the pain inside. We don't just become depressed, morbid, allow the evil difficulties to just come. No. We actively engage on trying to overcome the negativity. And this is actually one of the reasons why in our sharia, it is not allowed, now I'm going to go into a whole technical issue here, very quickly. What is mourning in Urdu? Mourning. Suba? No, not morning, morning. M-O-U-R, not morning, suba, suba, sham. When someone you mourn, M-O-U-R-N. Soul, S-O? Sog. Okay, I don't know this word. This is a new word for me. Okay, so then I'll use the English one. That morning, not subah. Hamare sharia mein, as you're aware, gunjaish hai. Kitne din ke liye? Sab ko malum hai. Teen din ke liye gunjaish hai. Iska kya matlab hai? I don't want to go into fiqh, except for the, you know, widow, lady, with all about that, char mahine, does that. Let's talk about the three-day one right now, so you understand. Kisi ka intiqal hota hai. Kisi ka bhi, other than the spouse, jo, uh, or than husband ka. Kisi ka intiqal hota hai. Teen din ke liye aapke paas gunjaish hai. Kya gunjaish hai? Kya aap apne zindagi mein tabdiliyon ko ijazat de dijiye. Khana, peena, utna, betna. It takes a while to go cope. Chutti le lije job se teen din ke liye. Okay. Ghar mein baithe rahiye zara. It's difficult. Yeah. You teen din ka. Aap apne tabdili lekar aajaye life mein. Mourn. You're coping with that. 
لیکن تین دن کے بعد شریعت کا ہے شریعت کا حصہ ہے دس از اے شریعہ رولنگ گیٹ ان دی ایکٹ اگین فورس یور سیلف ٹو گیٹ بیک اینڈ موونگ ڈونٹ جسٹ لیو ان دا پاسٹ ٹریجڈی جتنا بھی دکھ جتنا بھی غم جتنا بھی تین دن کے بعد اسٹینڈ اپ اینڈ اسٹارٹ واکنگ اگین کیوں کیوں آتا ہے ایسے بیکاز دا شریعت ڈزنٹ وانٹ یو ٹو لیو ان پاس ٹریجڈیز اس سے کوئی فائدہ نہیں ہوگا ناٹ ٹو یو ناٹ ٹو یور لوڈ ون ٹھیک ہے آئی نو اٹس پین فل یو لاسٹ اے لوڈ ون اے ٹائم ول کم ون یو ول گو اینڈ یور لوڈ ون ول بی آفٹر یو ڈو یو وانٹ دم ٹو اسٹاپ لیونگ بیکاز یو ڈائڈ یو وڈنٹ وانٹ یور اون لوڈ ون ٹو اسٹاپ لیونگ سو دا شریع ہیز کم ٹو گیو یو دیٹ لائف اینڈ ان اللہ مرسی ہی گیو اس تین دن حدیث میں بہت بہت ہی بہت ہی بیوٹیفل حدیث ہے ام سلمہ رضی اللہ عنہ وہ آپ تو یو نو یو آر آر مدر ام سلمہ ون آف دا وائز آف دا پروسیس سلم اینڈ آفٹر دا پروسیس ان پاسٹ اے ان کے پاس ایک ہی بھائی تھا کوئی اور فیملی نہیں تھی اور شی واز ریئلی کلوز ٹو ہر بردر ویری کلوز ٹو ہر بردر ام سلمہ کے بھائی کا انتقال ہو گیا تھا مدینہ میں دس از آفٹر دا ڈیتھ آف دا پروفیسر سلم شی ہیڈ نو فیملی لیفٹ دا اونلی فیملی شی ہیڈ واز ہر بردر اینڈ ویری کلوز بھائی کا انتقال ہو گیا تین دن شی واز ان گریف تین دن کے بعد وہ اپنے یو نو سروینٹ سے کہتی ہیں کہ وہ ہمارے وہ کپڑے لے کر آؤ اور پرفیوم لے کر آؤ اور کنگھی لے کر آؤ and told her to dress up in three days. Now, by the way, she doesn't have Huzur Sassam Haini Wahape. There is no husband to look up for. You know what I'm saying? She's a widow now at this stage. She doesn't have any other family. She dressed up, put on perfume after three days. Then she said to her servant, and because she said this, we know her psychology. She said, Wallahi, Allah ke qasam khari hume. Mujhko koi khushi nahi mil rahi hai. Koi shokh nahi hai to dress up and wear perfume. لیکن ہمارے حضور صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے فرمایا کہ کسی کو یہ گنجائش نہیں ہے کہ کسی کا ہم ڈو ان انگلش یو ڈو ناٹ ہیو دا رائٹ ٹو مور این اینی بڈی ایلس مور دین تھری ڈیز اینڈ تھری ڈیز ہو گیا اس لیے میں یہ کر رہی ہوں شی فورسڈ ہر سیلف ٹو گیٹ بیک ان ٹو دا روٹین دس از آور شریعہ یو ڈونٹ گو ان دا پاسٹ اینڈ ڈول ان ٹریجڈی نو ابن ہشام کہتا ہے کہ جب بی بی خدیجہ کا انتقال ہوا رضی اللہ عنہ جب ہمارے والد خدیجہ مدر خدیجہ کا انتقال ہوا تھا حضور صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے ایک سال تک ایک سال تک نو بڑی سو ہیم اسمائل ہی واز ہرٹ نتھنگ میڈ ہیم ہیپی ایک سال تک آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے کسی نے دیکھا اب انس نے مالک کے حدیث ہے صاحب بخاری میں انس نے مالک کون ہے مدنی صحابی ہیں مکہ میں انہوں نے نہیں دیکھا حضور کو وہ مکی ہے نا وہ مدنی ہے نا انس بن مالک انس بن مالک نے کیا بولا میں نے تو کسی کو نہیں دیکھا جو حضور وسلم سے زیادہ اسمائل کرتے تھے یہ کیا کوئی کانٹروڈکشن ہے یہ نو ناٹ ایٹ آل ایک ٹائم لگتا ہے ٹو پروسیس دیٹ گریف ایک ٹائم لگتا ہے ٹھیک ہے دیٹس فائن لیکن Eventually, he got back to normal. Eventually, he married again. Life goes on. But the love he had for Khadija never left. But life has to go on. That's what our Sharia teaches us. So we move on from a tragedy. We actively engage in trying to better the situation, change the situation. We don't just sit and mope and go back in the past. No. We engage with the world around us at every level to better our situation. If you're sick, Go to a doctor, see what you can do. If anything happens, how are you going to battle that tragedy? And in that process, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring that comfort and saving. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, the irony, even miracles, by the way, require some effort. Even miracles require some effort. No miracle happens without an effort. When Musa alayhi salam has to split the Red Sea, still Allah tells him, throw the staff in. When Maryam has to get the dates from the tree during the time of drought, there were no great dates. Allah says, shake the tree, then the dates will fall. Even the dates didn't fall for free. She had to put in the effort. So if miracles require some effort, do you think your mini miracle will not require an effort? You must put in the effort. Be actively engaged. And then the final point, inshallah ta'ala, And then a few minutes for Q&A as long as you guys want, inshallah. Final point, inshallah. So we talked about all these various points. Final point. The test of having passed a tragedy. 
and the sign of success or failure. Listen to this carefully. How do I know if I have passed the tragedy? How do I know, hopefully, because you can never be certain until the day of judgment. You can never be certain until the actual pass and card is given, right? That's yom al-hisab, yom al jaza. But you have signs in this world, isharats. Hamko kaise malum hai ki maine jo hai apna test pass kiya ki nahi pass kiya? One cheese, one simple criterion. Your status after the test should be better spiritually than it was before the test. Your status spiritually, your ibadat and your muamalat have to be better after the test than they were before the test. If you find that after the test, you're, if you weren't, let's say you weren't praying, you know, they're not even praying until the tragedy happens. And then all of a sudden, they become religious. You know what? That was Allah's gift to them. That was Allah's divine gift to them to bring them back to the straight path. You know, and then because of a calamity, because of a musibah, you know, they become they don't attend these types of lectures, Islamic lectures. They have no interest in anything to do with religion. To them it means nothing. But then something happens and they feel an emptiness and they want to fill that emptiness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with knowledge, with Quran, with dhikr. And so they form a connection with religion, religiosity, with halaqat, with dhikr, with ilm, with circles of knowledge, with listening to lectures, and it changes their lives forever. Again, that tragedy, that crisis was a gift to Allah. And this shows in post-calamity phase. However, however, if you find that a calamity distances you from Allah, if you find that a tragedy makes your heart harder, then billah, it is very possible that this calamity is the beginning of bigger punishments. And this tragedy really is an adab of Allah and a worse adab is waiting later on. Allah says in the Quran about the Quraysh that when the adab came down, their hearts became even harder. Qasat qulubuhum. We don't want that. We don't want that. So the purpose, therefore, of tragedy and pain is to soften our hearts, bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look forward to the ultimate hereafter. And again, lots of final points wrapping up here. Passing the test does not mean that whatever anxiety was there shall be eliminated. Again, I go back to my first or second point. Passing the test does not mean the cause of stress and the source of, of evil shall be taken away. For example, may Allah protect all of us, somebody's child is suffering and the mother says, I'm going to pass this test and I'm going to you know, make dua and I'm going to give sadaqah and I'm going to go for hajj. And she brings you know, lots of people to make dua and fun, funds you know, pages of you know, reciting Quran, whatever it might be. And Allah tests her by taking the child away. Shaitan comes and says, aha, look, you failed the test. Not at all. The life and death of the child has nothing to do with passing and failing the test. If she became a more spiritually conscious lady, and if she discovered a new relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then in reality, the loss of her child was meant to bring life to her heart. And Allah shall save the child in the hereafter. And Allah has saved its mother in this life. She has passed the test, even if her child passes away. Do you understand this point here? Passing the test does not mean the stress shall be eliminated. It goes back to my first points. Passing the test means you are more conscious of who you are, abd, makhluq. And you are more conscious of who Allah is, and that is the Rabb. And Keep on saying final point, but I want to teach you some du'as so that you will, um, inshallah ta'ala, uh, benefit from this. Some uh, du'as that you should be aware of. Uh, so you can write these du'as down. Write these du'as down. Of the best of du'as that you can say, is the one I already taught you. Allahumma 
inni as'aluka al-'afiyah fi ad-din wa ad-dunya Allahumma inni as'aluka al-'afiyah fi ad-din wa ad-dunya Oh Allah I ask you afiyah not to be tested in this deen or the dunya you ask Allah to try to eliminate those those tests of the duas that the prophet sallam would make sahih bukhari Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hamm wal hazan min al-hamm wal hazan Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hamm wal hazan ham is dil ki pareshaniya ham is something that is a responsibility in your heart and hazan some scholars have differentiated that ham is called by a pain in relationships and hazan is called by a pain in money or world hazan is a different type of parishani ham and hazan is both parishani right ham is a parishani a, a pain of the heart that you've taken on and scholars there's a number of opinions but one opinion is that ham is like a personal problem and hazan is a disconnected problem ham is like your friends your family hazan is like money or a, a debt that you might be in so the prophet is saying oh allah i seek refuge in you from the ham and the hazan you another dua that the prophet sallam taught us allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahla i'll say it slowly allahumma la sahla illa ma illa ma ja'altahu sahlan allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahlan i'll translate it in a bit allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahlan faj'al al-huzna sahlan faj'al al-huzna sahlan Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahlan faj'al al-huzna sahlan ay allah kuch nahi asan ho sakta hai illa ye ke jo tum asan kar lo there's no easiness except what you have brought made easy so ay allah ye jo hamare pareshani hai isko bhi aap asan kar lijiye allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahlan right wa anta ishi that you can add another phrase here you can make the huzn sahl allahumma ja'al al-huzn sahlan oh allah make my parishani easy there's other duas you know that are found in the sunnah as well but frankly more important than the wording of the dua is the spirit of your heart and even if you have not memorized any of these duas to say dua from your heart is more precious than the form of the dua so you can use your own words turn to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask allah to make this parishani easy ask allah to eliminate this parishani ask allah to give you the sabr you need ask allah to make things easy for you and then actively work against this parishani whatever it is get involved in whatever it might be as i give you examples if it's a sickness go to one doctor after another if it's an issue of your uh, money then find another mechanism for money if you got fired from one job go get another job if it's a family issue go get family therapy whatever it might be you have to solve it from the dunya even though allah is the one who actually brings the solution but you must put in the effort to find that solution and then throughout all of this put your trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look forward to the day where Insha'Allah ta'ala it will come there is no huzn there is no parishani and you will enter insha'Allah jannah to leave all parishaniya behind and with that we have come to some Q&A time so uh so uh Allahumma inni as'aluka al-'afiyah fi ad-din wa ad-dunya that's the first one uh the second one i said Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hamm wal huzn min al-hamm wal huzn And then the third one, Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahlan, sahlan. There is a phrase here. Wa anta idha shi'ta taj'alu al-hazana sahlan, faj'al al-hazana sahlan. Those that have written it down, you can get it from them as well, inshallah. Okay, so how do we do the Q&A now or what not? Right, Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh Saab. So you've, we'd like for you to um, put your questions on the piece of paper that you have. Jit bana ke humare jo volunteers hai, my young speakers hai jato. Unko deji ke volunteers, aapko nazar aare honge. So write your questions down and hand it over to any one of our volunteers. And we'll make sure that Sheikh Saab gets it. And I've got the faulty mic, I think. 
No, no, just give me the questions. And so we wait for your questions to come to us. Meanwhile, we've got some programs and, and courses. Um, uh, Live Deen Kajanim said, join Live Deen's grand conference this February to discover the strength inside of you to stand in resilience against the torrent of life's pressures. Maybe it's surviving a, a rocky marriage or surviving being single or just surviving life. Uh, that's happening on the 26th of Feb, uh, Marriott Hotel Karachi. Uh, tickets are available today at a very special price. Um, while we gather your questions, we have a video for you. Ji. أفسرها ككل الكائنات غريب في الحياة وفي الممات ومجهول الهوية والصفات كيف أعب قرآن حكيم كي أربي کو سمجھنا چاہتے ہیں آئے اس رمضان اللہ سے تعلق کو مضبوط بنائیں سیکھیں قرآن حکیم کے نفس الفاظ نماز اور بنیادی قوائد کے ذریعے صرف بیس گھنٹوں میں آئیے قرآن سمجھئے انتہائی آسان طریقے سے استاذ قاضی منصور استاذ امتیاز احمد استاذ محمد عامر یوسف کے ساتھ خواتین سیکھیں استاذہ شازیہ رحیم استاذہ راحت عباس اور دیگر اسازہ سے یہ کورس آپ آن لائن بھی کر سکتے ہیں اس کے علاوہ طالبان علم کو ٹیچر ٹریننگ بھی دی جاتی ہے لہٰذا قرآن سیکھیں اور سکھائیں آئیں مل کر قرآن کو عام کریں اور اپنی آخرت سواریں ریجسٹریشن کے لیے دیئے گئے نمبر پر رابطہ کریں Also, by the way, um, tomorrow is my other lecture uh, for those who are able to come, which is a little bit longer, inshallah, from 9 to 1.30. We're going to be talking about uh, the barzakh, like the journey of the soul. We're going to talk about from this world to the next, what happens to the soul. Can we communicate with the soul, our relationship with those that have gone on? Do we see them in dreams? Do they speak to us? Um, you know, gifting things to the dead. All of this, inshallah, will be uh, tomorrow from 9 to 1.30, inshallah. And, and thank you for the reminder. Tickets for that uh, workshop tomorrow are available. So if you haven't got them yet, Bahar um, Jateve, tickets are available at the desk, I've been told. Um, so you've seen the grand conference that is happening, the Quran course is happening. Uh, also, before, we're just gathering the questions right now and we'll put them to Sheikh Saab in just a bit. Just a reminder that when you leave tonight, uh, the way that we'll exit is we'll have the, the, the last row for the men exit first and then the next row and the next row and the next row. And as the men exit, just a reminder to grab your swag bags. Uh, then we'll have uh, the, the, the ladies exit as well. Um, so do we have the questions? We'll just hand them over to Sheikh Saab. Over to you. Uh, no, I'll, I'll take them this way. Yeah, it's better. over to you. I can do it quickly this way, inshallah. Okay. Uh, so uh, first question. Can you give us specific ways to be connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Really good question. Specific ways to be connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will tell you a number of ways. First and foremost, without a doubt, the strongest mechanism to be connected with Allah is the concept of dhikr. Now, concept of dhikr is misunderstood by a lot of people. Some people think dhikr means to just say random phrases throughout the day and night. But that's a type of dhikr. Dhikr is broader than just subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. The Quran is dhikr. Dua is dhikr. Any remembrance that reminds us of Allah is dhikr. Contemplating the heavens and earth and increasing our iman is a type of dhikr. Allah says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ يَتَفَكَّنُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ So dhikr is of many different types. Yes, one of them, Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, which is very important, but there's more types of dhikr. But no doubt, the concept of dhikr is the number one mechanism of bringing life to the heart. 
Through the dhikr of Allah, the hearts find tranquility. Point number one. Remember, dhikr is also Quran and whatnot. Number two, I'm going to mention even though I said it uh, as coming under dhikr, and that is dua. One of the strongest therapies that we need is dua. Guys, dua is a conversation you have with Allah. This is a whole other lecture which maybe another day I'll come and next time I come to Karachi. Dua is just an amazing tool and gift Allah has given us. There's nothing more therapeutic than dua. Because you know what dua is? Dua is a private audience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You open your heart in front of Allah and you just make everything in your heart open and you speak to Allah directly and Allah is hearing you. That's what dua is. A lot of people get lost in the technicalities of what I should say. And that's not as important as the niyyah of saying it. Your ikhlas, your frame of mind is infinitely more important than the words that you use. You know, one of the main questions, you know, shuyukh and scholars get from lay people. They come up to us and say, Sheikh Saab, ye parishani ho rie, iski liye ek dua sikhaiye mushko. They give you parishani X, they want dua Y, right? So there's this big book in our closets and cabinets, the secret book of duas that all sheikhs know, but nobody else knows, right? And you guys come to us, we go back into our closet, we pull this big book down, flick through the pages, find your specific dua, then we tell you, huh, say this 27 times at 6 p.m. Guys, guys, subhanAllah, we don't believe in magic incantations. Dua is not about form, it's about substance. Dua is not what you say, it's how you say it. Do you understand this point? The best dua you can make, listen to me carefully, is the one that is spontaneous from your heart in front of Allah. That's the best dua. Come straight from the heart. That's the best dua. Not what some random guy with a beard teaches you and say, no. No doubt, the du'as of the Qur'an and Sunnah are the best if you know what they mean. If you don't know what they mean, bro, it ain't gonna help you at all, man. Nothing. If you don't know what it means, and you're just parroting something in a book, I'm sorry, close the book and don't even do it. It's not du'a. Literally, guys, I'm, I might get into trouble for saying this. That's not du'a. If you don't know what it says on the paper, that's not du'a. Du'a comes from the heart. So you make dua in your own language. No scholar in human history has ever said, listen to me carefully, no alim has ever said that dua must be in Arabic. Nobody has said this. Dua can be in any language. So make dua in your language. And ask Allah to lift the, gr the grief, the hum, the pain, the suffering. Ask Allah for help. Ask Allah for the specifics of what you want in that dua. That's point number two. Point number three, how to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gain that spirituality. Point number three, Salat al-Tahajjud. Salat al-Tahajjud. The real difference between the A students and the B and C students is tahajjud. The A students, the creme de la creme, as we say in English, French English, <laughs> you really want to win the race? What separates the real talib of the akhirah is salat al tahajjud. And especially when you're in tragedy, especially when you're in grief. Tahajjud is the cure. Wake up two hours before Fajr, an hour, 30 minutes before Fajr. Just wake up before Fajr. Go to a place nobody is watching you except him. And pray, and as a part of your prayer, make dua. Dua of Tahajjud is the most blessed dua. It is the guaranteed dua of response. I just gave a Urdu lecture online. What is it called? No one What's the group called that I gave the lecture on, the Urdu lecture on dua? Muhammad Ali Mental Health. You can look it up. But it's on my YouTube channel uh, about the etiquettes of dua in Urdu. You can listen to that. And in that I mentioned that the best dua is the one that is made during Salat al-Tahajjud. In the last third of the night. 
And that's when du'as are accepted. So these are three things. I'll tell you one more thing to increase your spirituality. And this is greatly overlooked by most people. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ. It's a beautiful hadith, guys. Listen to this. Hadith is in Tirmidhi. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, O Messenger of Allah, I find that my heart is becoming hard. Mera dil sakht ho Kya karu Yani ke spirituality nahi hai, basically. I don't have spirituality. Mera dil sakht ho Kya karu? Do you know what the Prophet ﷺ said? Amazing hadith. Go find a yatim and wipe his head. Yani ke hug karo usko, right? And go find a faqir and usko ja ke khana do tum. Now you think of the psychology of this hadith. Huzur sallam nahi farmaya ja ke tahajjud par lo. Halay ke wahan bhi bhi aate ibadat. He said, go do service to humanity, khidmat e khalq. Go find somebody less fortunate than you and get involved in their lives. You know what's going to happen? You know, by the way, Meto, I, 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 you guys don't know this. I'm not here with utmost love and respect for you guys. I'm here for a fundraising event we're going to be doing online. You are, I wanted to do this voluntarily. I'm here for a fundraising issue. We're building an orphanage and school. Well, you'll, hear, you'll hear about this. That's why I'm here in Karachi right now. Today, I went to areas of Karachi I've never been in my life. I've been to Karachi like 12 times. I've never been to the slum areas. I don't want to mention the names, but I've never been to these areas where there is no electricity, there's no running water. I was there three hours ago. I'm just coming from there to here. And you know, I've been to many refugee camps and what I just didn't realize this existed in Karachi too, by the way. I did not realize people don't have that basics and I was in that region just two hours ago. And when you go visit these families that are struggling, you know, they're earning 100 rupees a day for working manual labor Beva or Beva Orte or with widows, you know, doing stuff like this and 100 rupees they're earning. And the, the, the life of difficulty, how can you not be appreciative of the blessings you have? And then I come back with my, you know, fancy meals and five star hotels and whatnot. You feel a sense of like, subhanAllah, how fortunate we are, how blessed we are. You know, Dil Naram Hujate, really, right? This is what our Prophet is saying. You, you, you want to get spirituality? I'm going to tell you something most people don't tell you. It's not just in rituals between you and Allah. It's also in khidmat khalq which is a ritual. Guys, helping mankind is also ibadah. And too many times religious folks ignore that aspect of religion. Too many times deen becomes only masjid and dhikr and ilm. And they forget that's half of it. I'm not making istighfarullah, I'm making fun. Of course, religion is ilm and of course, religion is... But how about religion being taking care of the yatim? Religion being... What about all of that stuff? Ta'amul miskin, yatim. Where did all that go? So you want spirituality? Volunteer to do something beneficial in the life of another human being that is not going to benefit you in this dunya. And guess what? All of a sudden your own priorities will change. Guess what? Not trying to trivialize your tragedy, but when you see the tragedies of other people living 20, 30 minutes away from you, when you see how they're living their lives, all of a sudden your stock market crash becomes very different than what it was the day before. You get my point here, right? So these are some ways you can uh, contextualize this. Okay, question here. Uh, what do we do if we are getting... Uh, suicidal thoughts, subhanAllah, this is a very, very <laughs> difficult question. Realize, I have given a longer lecture on suicide, please uh, listen to it online. Realize that getting waswasa to end your life at some stage, at some stage, it happens to many people. And that's why the Quran has come to forbid it because it does happen. Don't feel that just because you're getting these thoughts that you are a bad person. In fighting these thoughts, you will gain your nobility. Allah says in the Quran, Wala taqutulu anfusakum. Don't kill yourselves. Khud kushi mat karo. Khud kushi mat karo. Then what does Allah say? Inna Allah kana bikum rahima. What a beautiful way to end this verse. Allah is full of rahmah for you. 
Notice, khudkushi ka mana is in the same ayah. Where does Allah finish it? Allah doesn't say, if you do so. How does Allah end the verse? وَلَا تَقْتُرَ أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Allah has full of rahmah for you. For you, bikum. So don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Whatever difficulty you're facing, three Fs will help you. Faith, family, and friends. Faith, family, and friends. Three Fs will help you in that order. Good faith, good family, good friends. But sometimes you need more than this. So don't feel shy to get help from those that are experts in this field. We have a problem. I don't know in Pakistan what is the situation. I'm assuming it's the same as we have it. That mental problems are considered to be taboo. There's a stigma about mental therapy. There's a stigma about psychiatry. There's a stigma about dealing with actual clinical depression. Many of us don't even realize it's an actual thing called depression. And because we don't realize it, recognize it, things happen that shouldn't happen. In America, we are slowly overcoming the stigma amongst our Muslim communities. More and more of us Imams are getting trained and, and understanding that this is an actual problem. I don't know how it is in Pakistan. I will tell you from my own experiences. I also used to think myself that there's no such thing as depression. I also used to think man-made jiza. But it took me years of being active in a community. You know, I always say, experience teaches you what books will not teach you. Experience teaches you what books will not teach you. And one thing you need to understand with utmost love and respect, those who are trained in seminaries are not trained in psychiatry. They're not trained to deal with human emotions. I say this as somebody who has been trained in a seminar, I'm not putting seminaries down. Seminaries, madrasas, are meant for a very specific focus, you know, fiqh questions, aqidah questions. They're not meant for emotional, you know, tarbiyah. They're not meant for psychiatry. So understand this point. Go to the people of specialities for their specialities. I did not train for 10 years in Medina to be a psychiatrist. So I can help you a little bit theologically. But if it's a psychiatric issue, I cannot help you. It's not my training. So go to a psychiatrist. Come to me for the theology. Come to me for some basic motivations in the Quran and Sunnah. If it's not good enough, try your family and friends. If you're still struggling, it might actually be a medical issue. There could be a hormonal imbalance which is beyond your control. So go seek professional help and maybe find out. There could be a trauma that you're dealing with, you know, and that's beyond my pay grade. I don't know how to deal with childhood trauma, something happened to you. So understand that just to have these thoughts does not make you a bad person. Understand this. In battling these thoughts, you gain nobility. And go to people whom you love and trust. Go to, first and foremost, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's faith there. Open up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Find comfort in what we said. Then, good family that's going to support you because sometimes family will make fun of you. Or not. You don't want that type. Good family, good friends. And then if that still doesn't help, go to those who will help professionally. And I'm sure, you know, you will find people like this uh, uh, over here as well, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, here we have a question here. By the way, how much time do you want to stay? I don't want to keep you longer. That's what I was told. That's what I was told. Last question. Take it up with Noman Bhai. He is the boss. The last question is the most important question. What are the questions here? What are the questions here? Sheikh, uh, we're, yeah, I mean, you have about 10 minutes. I think, uh, I know people have commitments, so we don't want to hold them also. Okay, no problem. So, but if people want to stay, I, I am I'm perfectly okay with it I also. That's what I was told. That's what I was told. Anyway, I'm just kidding with you guys. It's all right. I have to be resting for tomorrow as well. So, so 10 minutes is enough, inshallah. 10 minutes will be done. Okay, so now we have here a question that um, I'm a person who's excessively worrying and having negative thoughts. Uh, can I practice meditation? Our MC, did you ask this? Where's our MC gone? Huh? 
Did you ask this question about, can I practice meditation? Or it wasn't you, because I heard you say you, were, you wanted to do meditation and then the guy hung up on you. Don't worry, I'm not going to hang up on you, okay? Can I practice meditation? Dekhiye, meditation in and of itself, tafakkur, is therapeutic. But what do you mean by meditation? If by meditation you mean that you think about the meaning of life, the purpose of trials and tribulations, you think about the positives of your life and how you're going to do all of this is a part of what we call in Arabic tadabbur and tafakkur. That's all fine, no problem there. But if you mean a type of ritual or practice that is based in fates that are not our fates, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's not, we have better things, we have better substitutes than that, okay? This, this notion of just sitting in a certain trance and pose, okay? It might become ritualistic even though you don't intend to be rituals. You get my point here, right? To sit in a certain way and to have whatever the yogas, whatever say, you're really getting into gray territory if you follow that understanding. But we can halalify it. This is a new word, halalify. Really, we can halalify it. How so? There are mainstream concepts known as tadabbur, known as tafakkur, right? Known as muhasabatun nafs. These are mainstream concepts within our tradition. And they are self-meditation and reflection about yourself, about your blessings that have happened to you, about you know, the future, about how you're going. This is very, very Islamic. And if you want to call it meditation, no problem. Sit, contemplate, and wonder. In fact, the Quran praises those who contemplate about the creation. This is a type of meditation. Go on a nature walk, literally. I'm going to confess to you, some of you know this. I love scuba diving. I love it. I have a passion for it. I've done over 200 dives. I'm a rescue scuba diver. I was just in diving a few weeks ago in Little Cayman Islands, in the middle of nowhere. That's my vacation from all you guys. I go in a place nobody knows and I jump into the water with sharks and whale sharks and whales and whatnot. I love it. Do you know what I want to know? One of the reasons why I love scuba diving, tafakkur, meditation. I am cut off from, you cannot talk to anybody. Literally, you are wearing a mask and everything. 200, 150 feet under the water. All the way up there, you see. And what you see down there, subhanallah, the beauty, the colors, the vibrancy, the creation of Allah in a totally different world, even though it's just 200 feet from there, literally as if you're in an alien life. To me, this is meditation. My iman taza ho jata hai jaake. Niche jaake taza ho jata hai. Really, because that's what meditation is. So what do you call meditation? It really is. Like I said, you're going to sit in a pose and a ritual, take your arms out like this, say, um, um, um. No, bro, we don't need to go there, man. We have better things than that. But if you mean every five, ten minutes in the morning, I'm just going to shut off my internet, my cell phone. I'm just going to think about what I'm doing, what my purpose is today. Sure, that's tadabbur and tafakkur. Call it whatever you will. The concepts, guys, don't get hooked up on the term. Think about what it means. All too often, fatwas come based on the term. Forget the term. Throw the term out the window. What are you doing? If what you're doing is what will bring you, make you a better person, bring you, you know, more spiritual, alhamdulillah, that's fine. And if what you're doing is not that, then, you know, that is problematic. Um, okay, so let's just finish up here, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, here, okay, very good question here. Is it from ihsan to not discuss our problems you know, with other people basically? Should we keep our problems to ourself? Very, very good question. Or may we share it with others? This will be a final question inshallah because it is getting late for all of us inshallah. Um, this is a question where there is a bit of attention. A bit of attention. On the one hand, a sign of perfection of Iman is that you try to not get the pity of other human beings as much as possible. Because think of their pity, pity think of their pity as their sadaqa. Kisiko pasanata bhig magna? It goes against your dignity. You like that? Kisiko ni pasanata? It's not a part of our fitra, right? So think of their pity. Like asking for sadaqah. 
Would you like to go with your hands outstretched and just ask, ask, ask? No. But a good friend sees that you have a need and will offer you. Yes. You see the difference? Now, is it haram to ask for pity? Not at all. But is it prophetic? Is it ideal? Is it manifesting the highest levels of Iman? No, it's not. Those that have reached that maqam, they don't go around asking for pity. Like Ya'qub, what did he say in Surah Yusuf? Ya'qub, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ مَا تُو شِكَائِتْ صِرَفْ أَلَّا سَكَرْتَهُ What does it mean, شِكَائِتْ أَلَّا سَكَرْنَا? A lot of people don't understand, شِكَائِتْ أَلَّا سَكَرْنَا. Shikaid here means you open your heart out to Allah. You complain to Allah, not about Allah. You see the difference? The one is iman, the other is kufr. Complain to Allah. What does it mean, complain to Allah? Hey Allah, you're watching how many problems are for us. Hey Allah, you're watching how my heart is hurting. Hey Allah, you're the one that helps. Hey Allah, you are the Arham al-Rahimin. This is complaining to Allah. Complaining about Allah, a'udhu billah, is kufr. So, shikayat Allah se karteh means complaining to Allah. Now, the Prophet never, ever went to another person for sympathy. But, Allah himself consoled him. And he advised the Sahaba to not ask others. But again, that is a maqam that is the highest of the high. And at some level, so, don't set yourself up to be in the top 1%. Work your way there. Work your way there. But don't set it up. Be realistic in this regard. We all, at a lower stage, need a shoulder to cry on. It helps having good friends, good family. And it's okay to open up and get some, you know, some therapy from them. But work your way that your most therapy should be from Allah directly. And work your way to minimize but don't think you're going to jump in one night to get there automatically because that might be too difficult to bottle up too much. You get my point here, right? It is not a sin to ask for sympathy. It's not a sin. It's not a sin to go to somebody, you know, to get that shikayat kisi ke baare mein and get that, you know, you know, oh, it's, zulm kiya, la, la. it's fine. Human nature. It's all of us do it. As, but the prophets did not do it. I mean, look at the seerah. Did he even ever complain about what the Quraysh did to him to somebody else? Did he go and say, Abu Did he do that? Would it not be undignified for our Prophet to do that? Never once did he do that because he was who he was. So he's our role model. But understand, you're not going to get to that level. So it's a delicate question here. You have to work your balances out. Bottom line, try your best to be dignified and to keep your worries as much as you can between you and Allah. But realize it is not obligatory to do so. And if you need to get help, if you need to open up, it's completely permissible, but do so with those whom you trust and who genuinely love you. So that it doesn't become more problematic in the long run. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, jazakumullah khair for attending tonight. I hope that inshallah, I hope that inshallah Mary Urdu jo hai wo theek thaak thi inshallah okay agar koi isme agar agar koi khubiyan thi khubiyan means ha huh? see i made a mistake here koi kamiya or kamiya kamiya theek hai oh khamiya what does that mean so what does khubiyan mean that's what i meant khubiyan <laughs> you get my point. You can write it down and send it forward, inshallah. And I hope, inshallah, to see you all tomorrow. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, ladies um, exiting on the right. I think the people, uh, ladies on the right, exit first. The men on the left exit first. And then, accordingly, uh, that will allow some segregation. On your way out, On your way out, uh, you'll be handed out a bag, uh, a swag bag. It's got a selection of different items. Uh, it's a randomized se selection of the items. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, remember, we are starting at 9 a.m. tomorrow.
inshallah. So we look forward to uh, having you there. For those who have not bought a ticket, they are available outside at our stall. Jazakallah uh, khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.